May 27, 1831. Present-day Southern Kansas, a group of New Mexico-based merchants are gathered in a tight cluster, making their way southwest down the Cimarron River. They are nervous, with an unspoken tension pervading the air that surrounds their small party. They have stopped to take a respite from the late spring heat, having just completed the trading they had come so far to engage in. But here, in the open expanses of the prairie, business was not always just business. Things here on the southern plains could, and often did, devolve quickly into overt, horrific violence. It was not wholly uncommon for an enterprising, overly optimistic merchant to venture out into these lands with hopes of brokering highly profitable trades and solidifying lucrative relationships with the rulers of this harsh, unremitting territory, the Comanche. Many of these hopeful capitalists were simply never seen again. Some returned wealthy men, some returned traumatized survivors of Comanche wrath. These merchants, though, had managed to broker mutually beneficial relationships with the Comanche that had lasted for decades by this point in the early 19th century. They had occupied the territories of what is now the state of New Mexico and was then known as New Spain for generations, nearly as long as the Comanche. In the preceding century and a half, the Comanche had unleashed a torrent of violence across what are now the states of Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. Their motivations were in part retribution, payback for their cruel treatment at the hands of neighboring tribes like the Cheyenne and Blackfoot, and in part ambition. They, like the Spanish to the south, were intent on capturing as much of the wide open expanses of the American frontier as possible. But for all their reputation as war fighters and empire builders, they were also incredibly adept traders. Of course, the threat of mortal violence is a powerful bargaining chip, but the Comanche prided themselves on being knowledgeable and formidable negotiators in bartering for the goods they desired. These New Mexico merchants had largely avoided the violence of Comanche expansion by providing them with a reliable, sustainable source of trade for the goods they valued but could not produce themselves. The Comanche possessed the largest collective swath of North American territory of any tribe on the continent. They were rich in land, buffalo meat, buffalo hides, and horses. But they had no tradition in pottery, nor weaving, nor any access to metals such as copper and iron that they highly prized. The iron was highly prized for use as arrow and spearheads, while the copper was often beaten into discs and worn as jewelry on necklaces, bracelets, or woven into the long braids of thick hair the Comanche prided themselves on. Many of the paints that they could procure from traders were of more vibrant hues and resilient finishes than the ones they made themselves from natural dyes and animal fats. Cotton shirts, hats, jewelry, and of course, firearms were all prized to differing degrees by the Comanche. And, more often than not, the Comanche bartered with men like this small group of weary, weather-beaten traders who were often comprised of small bands of family members or close friends. They were the descendants of Spanish settlers who had often intermarried into the surrounding tribes. Their way of life in the desolate expanses of New Mexico and West Texas was a perpetually difficult, dangerous affair. But after peace with the Comanche had been brokered by Governor Juan Bautista de Anza in 1778, trade between the Spanish descendant settlers of New Spain and the Comanche began in earnest. Before long, a regular system of trade was established where intrepid bands of traders ventured out into the no-man's land that was Comancheria. Most were men from hard backgrounds who found little comparable opportunity anywhere else. Many died hard, horrendous deaths at the hands of the Comanche or other tribes like the Apache or the Kiowa. Many were robbed, many were killed, and many robbed and killed others. They developed their own fringe society away from the norms of New Spain or the burgeoning power of the United States. They became known as Comancheros for their proclivity and aptitude for dealing with a tribe whose mere mention could send waves of panic through settlements all through Texas and Mexico. This particular group of Comancheros here on the Cimarron River had traveled a long way to conduct their business and now only hoped to get home with their profits 
as soon as possible. They spoke briefly in their huddled formation about the trades that they had made, the profits they had taken, and their unanimous desire to put distance between themselves and the party of Comanche they had just traded with. To a man, the small party was aware that there was nothing to stop the Comanche from trailing them for a while, only to kill them all, recoup the items they had traded away, and walk away with little to no consequence. But, just as they were about to resume their course southward, one of them spots a figure only a few hundred yards in the distance. Even at this distance, it is clear the figure approaching them on horseback is not a Comanche. As the rider comes toward them, he attempts to wave them down to engage in conversation. As he draws nearer, it becomes apparent that he is an American. In fact, though the Comancheros would have no way of knowing it, this was one of the most well-known and well-traveled Americans alive at the time. While the Comancheros knew the vast expanses of their homeland like the backs of their hands, they did not know, nor in many instances could they scarcely imagine, the scope or extremity of this American man's travels in the previous decade. Barring but a few possible exceptions, this lone writer had seen more of the North American continent than anyone alive at the time. He had come from upstate New York, worked on freighter ships that sailed the expanses of the Great Lakes, and made his way to the burgeoning city of St. Louis. From there, he had traveled from the Dakotas to the Rocky Mountains, the Mojave Desert, the missions of Southern California, the San Joaquin Valley, the Sierra Nevadas, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and then all the way north through present-day Oregon and Washington into Canada. He had survived the deadliest attacks on record from the Arikara in South Dakota to the Mojave in California to the Umpqua in Oregon. He had worked with and under some of the most legendary names in mountain man history, men like William Ashley, Hugh Glass, Jim Bridger, William Wolfskill, Milton Sublett, William Sublett, Joseph Meek, and Bill Williams, to name but a few. Most of the men he had traveled and worked with, though, had died violent deaths in their pursuit of fortune in the wilds of a continent that they, in the initial throes of manifest destiny, believed to be rightfully and inherently theirs. He had narrowly survived a vicious mauling by an enraged grizzly bear, one that necessitated his ear being sewn back onto his head by a crude frontier surgery without the benefit of anesthetic. This incident left him permanently scarred and saw him wear his hair longer from then on in order to hide the scars. He had been detained by Mexican officials in California who were in fact rightfully dubious as to the intentions of these curiously dressed Americans who claimed they were merely passing through their bountiful territory. Through it all, he had remained steadfast in his faith as a Methodist and his ardent commitment to the venture capitalism he hoped would provide for his family. His name was Jedediah Strong Smith. Just the year before, he had made his way back to St. Louis, cashed in on the pelts he had collected at the price of so many lives lost and miles covered, and vowed never to enter the mountains again. He purchased a sizable home on what is now Broadway Street in St. Louis and sent a banknote for $1,500 back to Ohio in order to purchase land neighboring one of his brother's farms. Three of his younger brothers had come to live with him in St. Louis, where he hoped to be able to provide them with better economic opportunity than he had found upon his initial forays from home at their age. He repeatedly swore in numerous correspondence to family and friends that his days in the mountains were done. His mother had recently passed away, and the incessant internal tumult that had hounded him since he left home, another sentiment that often litters the journal entries and letters of Jedediah Smith, incessantly harped at his conscience that he should travel to his family's new homestead in Ohio to care for his aging father. But in the time since returning to St. Louis in 1829 and the spring of 1831, the incessant wanderlust that had driven him to such distances began to drown out the guilt that he felt for his extended departure from his home and family. He had written to the Secretary of War, John Eden, 
requesting to be made part of a proposed military expedition into the Rocky Mountains. To be sure, there would be few men in the world more qualified to lead the expedition than Jedediah Smith. But Smith never received a response from Eaton, and the expedition never materialized. Smith then began to look towards the prospect of publishing his memoirs, along with the numerous maps he had compiled during his travels. Even throughout the most dire of times in his travels, Smith had, with at least some measure of consistency, recorded his thoughts in a series of journals. In addition, he was a skilled cartographer whose maps were accurate and reliable. He hoped to illuminate the entirety of the eastern seaboard and perhaps even Europe with tales of his exploits complete with the maps that he had drawn. To do this, though, he felt he needed to add at least one trip to his already expansive list of expeditions. The town of Santa Fe, in what is now the state of New Mexico, had been growing in population and reputation as a trading post and way stop on the trip to California. And so, after not hearing back from Secretary of War Eaton, Smith decided to sign on with an expedition to Santa Fe with William Sublett and David Jackson. The three men would lead a wagon train carrying roughly $20,000 in goods to Santa Fe. Smith also enlisted Samuel Parkman to assist in arranging his writings and maps into a publishable manuscript, as well as to polish his Spanish skills so that he might decipher some of the Spanish terms recorded in Smith's diaries with more accuracy. The trail from St. Louis to Santa Fe was well-traveled and even in 1831, was considered well-established and comparatively safe. Few lives were lost annually to either privation or attacks from natives. In comparison to the trips Smith had been making for the past decade, this endeavor would have seemed to be a relatively easy affair, despite the distance being over 1,000 miles. The wagon train, complete with 83 men, left for Santa Fe in the spring of 1831, in high spirits with aspirations of completing a timely profitable trip. They headed southwest, and initially, all had gone well. Then, trouble began to befall the party. First, on May 19th, a company clerk who had long worked for Sublet and Jackson, a man recorded only as Minter, was murdered by Pawnee warriors when he wandered off from the main party near the Pawnee River, a tributary of the Arkansas River. Then, the water began to run out. By May 27th, the party was completely out of water for both men and livestock. All the established water sources on the trail had thus far proven dried up. On that morning, much the same as they had for the previous few mornings, Smith and his cohorts would pair up and fan out in different directions from their camp in an attempt to find any viable water sources. Smith and his partner, a man named Fitzpatrick, headed south on that morning, hoping to find a spring on the north side of the Cimarron River. The Cimarron itself flows through several mineral deposits, rendering the water not potable as it is too salty. However, several springs lie nearby the river which do produce drinkable water. Smith and Fitzpatrick thought perhaps they were getting close that morning when they had happened upon a depression in the flat landscape that harbored damp ground at its lowest point. Smith directed Fitzpatrick to stay there and attempt to dig for water in the depression while he rode ahead to see if there were any springs nearby. While Fitzpatrick began digging, Smith headed off further south. Within a few miles, he was out of sight of Fitzpatrick. Within a few more, he came into sight of this band of Comancheros. The Comancheros are alarmed. The legendary mountain man lopes his horse towards them speaking to them in broken Spanish, asking where water might be found. To the Comancheros, he presents a clear and present danger, not only to himself, but to them as well. The Comancheros offer him no water, and only point him towards a spring a few miles away. The Comancheros offer him no water, and only point him towards a spring a few miles away. They also inform him, in concise, broken English, that the Comanche were nearby and that he would not be able to avoid them, no matter his next move. Furthermore, he is informed that he must make the next move immediately, as he presented a liability to the Comanchero's party. Should the Comanche find him in their company, they might suppose him to be a spy and kill them all. 
This was not a risk the Comancheros were willing to take for the lonesome and now doubtless fear-stricken American. He was on his own. Seeing no better course of action, Jedediah Smith continues on in the direction of the spring the Comancheros had informed him of. He departs from the Comancheros, resolutely making his way forward and mustering all the courage and wherewithal he might bring to bear. He and his party would surely die without the water, and while he knew there was a very real possibility that the Comanche would usher him into an even more immediate end, Smith saw little other course of action. As the Comancheros watch from a distance, he makes his way further south, to what is now known as Wagon Bed Spring in southwestern Kansas. Just before he reaches the spring, a band of 15 to 20 Comanches come upon him. They have spotted Smith before he even departed the Comanchero party, and spent the time it took him to ride to the spring, discussing in Spanish what they would do with this trespassing American. For all intents and purposes, Smith and his company were indeed trespassing. In fact, the entire trade they had been plying for the past decade or more was technically illegal and in violation of numerous treaties that forbade hunting and trapping in native or foreign lands. The Comanche, though, are not concerned with the legalities of any particular treaty on this day. They see him as an intolerable interloper, a representative of a people who have sought to invade their lands. Also, they may have seen him as sport. Smith does his best to stay calm, hailing the Comanche with a smile and signing to them in the ubiquitous sign language of the plains that he was merely passing through and hoping to slake his thirst as well as his horses. He searches the faces of the Comanche warriors who surround him, the notoriously stout and rugged looking ponies striking such an odd juxtaposition against their master's formidable reputation. The Comanche too look different than any of the other tribes Smith has encountered on the plains. They themselves are shorter and stockier than their northern plains counterparts, with, especially at this time in the early 19th century, little of the cosmetic adornments of their plains cohorts such as war bonnets or white-boned breastplates. The Comanche, in particular, cut a stark, terrifying figure even for the most experienced of travelers on the frontier. And, in accordance with their reputation, no warrior among them returns Smith's smile or salutations. For a few tense, terrifying seconds, the two parties stare silently at each other. Then, the Comanche begin to encircle Smith, moving into their positions while taunting Smith's horse, trying to spook him into throwing his rider. Smith, for his part, still attempts to broker some kind of peace that might allow him to trade some of his valuables for his safe passage back to his party. But as the situation rapidly develops, it becomes clear that the Comanche are not interested in any deal. Just as the Comanche have Smith half surrounded in a crescent moon formation, a shot rings out from a Comanche rifle. A lead ball tears into Jedediah Smith's right shoulder as the noise simultaneously startles his horse, causing both animal and rider to wheel about 180 degrees. Smith had laid his Kentucky rifle across his lap before being accosted by the Comanche, and as his horse turned, Smith managed to shoulder the weapon and return fire, killing one of the warriors whom later accounts would describe as a chief. As the Comanche warrior's body slumps from his mount and thuds to the hard Kansas dirt, Jedediah Smith reaches for one of the two single-shot pistols he keeps tucked in his belt. In the seconds it takes to accomplish this, the remaining Comanche warriors now fully enraged at the killing of one of their own, pounce upon Smith, knocking him off of his horse. As soon as he hits the ground, it is all but certain Jedediah Smith knows he is going to die. The Comanche have spent so much effort attaining their empire in the southern plains, largely because of the immense buffalo herds that reliably roamed its expanses. In order to kill the gigantic, aggressive, and fleet of foot buffalo, the Comanche often employed the use of 12 to 14 foot spears that could be used to stab a buffalo from a distance. The animal would be struck under the ribs so that the most damage might be done to the target's internal organs. The same tactic was employed against human enemy targets. From atop their stout ponies, the remaining Comanche drove their lances 
into the torso of America's most legendary, accomplished mountain man. The attack is incredibly swift and unspeakably violent, as the Comanche mock and club the dying man. The only mercy for the unfortunate Smith is that it is all over in a matter of seconds. As his body lies lifeless, covered in blood and plains dust, the Comanche strap their dead compatriot to his horse, take Smith's horse, his guns, and valuables, and leave him to the buzzards and the summer sun. Jedediah Smith's body would never be found, and it would be days later until the Comancheros would encounter the sublet Jackson party on the Santa Fe Trail. Here, they would produce Smith's pistols and rifle to his grief-stricken younger brother, Austin. The Comancheros had traded the Comanche for the items after their murder of Smith and acquired the Comanche's side of the story. They corroborated this with their own eyewitness accounts, and these accounts were relayed back to Smith's elderly widower father in Ohio in a letter from Austin Smith. The letter, heart-wrenching in its revelations even two centuries later, reads as follows. Your son Jedediah was killed on the Cimarron the 27th of May on his way to Santa Fe by the Kermanche engines. His party was in distress for water and he had gone alone in search of the above river which he found when he was attacked by 15 or 20 of them. They succeeded in alarming his animal, not daring to fire on him so long as they kept face to face. So soon as his horse turned, they fired and wounded him in the shoulder. He then fired his gun and killed their head chief. It is supposed they rushed upon him and dispatched him. An obituary would be published for him that fall in the Illinois Intelligencer, but no mention of his death was made in his adopted hometown of St. Louis's local publication. His memoirs and maps would not only not be published, but his legacy and legend would be largely forgotten by the public for the better part of a century and a half. Jedediah Smith never married, nor had any children. In his brief 32 years, he had managed to incessantly, seemingly impulsively, pursue his intentions of wealth and security to ends that had thus far been unheard of in American history. To add even more to the decidedly unserendipitous nature of Smith's final expedition, the remainder of the party on the Santa Fe Trail, including Sublet, Jackson, and Smith's younger brother, Austin, were all able to find water and eventually make their way safely to Santa Fe. From here, Austin Smith would pursue his own successful career in mercantilism, and Sublet and Jackson would continue on to California in order to return with a large remuda of horses and mules to trade and sell in Santa Fe and Missouri. In the entirety of the year of 1831, the only lives lost on the Santa Fe Trail would be those of the unfortunate mentor at the hands of the Pawnee and Smith at the hands of the Comanche. Life in the Old West was always hard and often cheap. The violence and hardships that befell people of all races, religions, and backgrounds could be startlingly indiscriminate and stunningly swift. And so it was that one of the most expansive, interesting lives in American history was snuffed out. Despite all his exploits, he found himself but a stranger in a strange land, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. But the annals of Old West history are replete with far more stories of Smith, his fellow mountain men, as well as the countless natives and settlers they interacted with. Tales of lives lost, fortunes gained, and miles traveled are more numerous than the stars in the open western sky. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to hit like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History 2 Real for the Westerns.